And I now introduce our final speaker for the session, who's uh, Kate McCarthy. Uh, Kate's an infectious diseases um, specialist at the Royal Brisbane Hospital. She's the clinical lead of the HIT and OPAT services uh, and practices also as a medical microbiologist. Thank you very much, Kate. Kate's going to be talking to us about uh, considerations for antifungals and antivirals in OPAT and HIT. Now, John, I actually have a... I was the renal registrar in Darwin many years ago, and um, I have a link to those report cards because I was awarded by Gary Lum as the uh, junior doctor in the hospital who wrote the least clinical notes for six months running on the microbiology request forms. But now, now I'm a microbiologist, I can't support that in any way. <laughs> I was busy. <laughs> All right. Um, so this is a little bit more of a, a technical talk. Um, and when I saw it, I thought, oh, this is a great opportunity to review what we've done. But inwardly, I secretly sighed as well. <laughs> Um, so I guess uh, when we talk Heath and OPAD, often we're talking apples and oranges. And so as mentioned previously, the way you describe what you supply really depends on um, your service and, and, and what you're talking about. So I thought I'd just take a couple of slides to explain what we offer um, at our hospital. So we actually have two services for funding reasons. We have one of which both I um, am the clinical lead for, one which is called OPAT. And this is really a service that's based in the outpatient setting. So there's our clinic room there, and through that we do short-term administration of antibiotics in the outpatient setting, and that's where we also train all our um, patients to uh, use self-connectors. And Sarah, I think I see you there in the, the photo. Now, our HIT service, however, is based uh, separately to the hospital. And this is a service, more traditional, I guess, in which the nurses visit the patient at home and they administer their antibiotics or connect an infuser. Now, in terms of our administration options, um, I feel we're lucky to have both services because it allows us to obviously use elastomeric pumps, uh, give patient direct infusions, and then this here is an example of the clunky connector we use for the um, OPAT service for patients to connect their own um, antibiotics. So I guess that's the basis I come from when I talk about um, antivirals and antifungals um, in our setting. I don't want to talk about the patient selection for OPAT because that's been covered um, previously. And obviously it is important to have good patient selection. But there was a nice review paper reference which really um, talked about the issue, issue specific to antifungal therapy. And I think they're quite correct. I think with antifungal therapy, there has to be um, uh, close attention to interactions of the antifungal drugs. Um, there does have to be enhanced monitoring for side effects of antifungal agents. And um, uh, relating to point four there, I think there needs to be some experience with administration of these agents so you can pick up these side effects and be aware of how you should monitor them. And it's very important, and I think um, probably most services have this policy to have early dose administration within the hospital setting. So if there are problems, they can be managed and adjusted and rates can be adjusted, et cetera, or pre-medication <laughs> given so that therefore they can be given successfully in the community setting. So a little bit separate to um, antibiotics. In terms of the, uh, and many of you being pharmacists will know this, but obviously the antifungal agents um, available to us belong to a number of different classes. And the ones we're really going to talk about today are the polyenes and also the echinocandins. The other thing I wanted to do was place utilisation within context. So amphotericin has been our workhorse of antifungal um, therapy for a long time. But however, with time, we've had um, new drugs on the market, which changed the way that we have used, for example, amphotericin. And really, we're now getting more azoles with broader spectrum and increasing evidence. And they have such good bioavailability that really utilisation as an IV agent is very limited once the patient is ready to go home. So azo drugs only get one side. And um, as I said, there's increasing evidence. Really, they have limited nephrotoxicity. And obviously, oral administration is much cheaper than IV administration. So I went back and had a look. We have a database covering the last three years only, and um, we're a large hospital, and we have a large haematology and oncology unit that does bone marrow transplant. But despite that, as you can see, 
In the last three years, there's only really been four patients we've been required to give an amphotericin-based product in the outpatient setting. But they have stayed with us for quite a long period of time. And probably this attests to the fact that these patients are heavily immunosuppressed, they often have comorbidities, they have serious infections, and as such, you know, the ability to administer this medication to the, in the outpatient setting is limited due to the patient uh, that comes before you. So really, more recently, what we've really only used it for is a cryptococcal uh, infection. And so what I went looking for was, uh, you know, experience with this in terms of the community and administration. And really there's only one major paper on this. And this is a retrospective observational study over about five years in adult and paediatric patients. And basically they had 105 patients with 133 courses of therapy. Um, the majority had some haematological or oncological malignancy. And most of these, oh, sorry, I should say, probably 41 of these courses were liposomal amphotericin, uh, 31 amphotericin deoxycholate, and then um, another 31 being able set. Um, they gave standard doses that we're used to, standard infusion times, and there were long courses of therapy, much like it was shown in our setting. Only 50% of the cases they actually used um, uh, prehydration with the patients. So no doubt from your experience, what they ran into is really what we'd expect. They found nephrotoxicity in 41% uh, of the courses, and this developed across four to 105 days, so there was no particular time in terms of when it started. And they also found that when they went and did statistics at the end, that not unexpectedly, uh, if you didn't use salt loading, you were more likely to run into nephrotoxicity. So this is a quite an important part of when you give this type of medication. Electrolyte abnormalities are the other thing that you can run into. So 35% of patients uh, develop these. A large number of these were able to be managed by um, oral supplementation with only two courses requiring hospital admission. In terms of the device complications, two patients, it was 11%, but to be honest with you, a lot of these were dislodgement um, or pick line infections. Um, but importantly, two of these were a thrombosis. Infusion reactions, which require management, occurred in 12% of courses, and readmission rates due to complications were in 12% of courses, uh, and 25% of courses were stopped due to adverse events. So really this data attests to the fact that you require a monitoring and also management um, of these um, adverse effects. So when I was looking for something to make this talk a little bit lighter, I thought what I could find you was a list. <laughs> and so side effects of amphotericin have been put into this mnemonic here for you to remember. So in terms of our cryptococcal patient, I thought I might just focus on him for a moment. So he was a 59-year-old male who is uh, immunosuppressed with common variable immunodeficiency. He had bronchiectasis, um, hepatosplenomegaly, kidney, kidney disease and gout. And he presented with back pain, uh, had imaging and a biopsy, as it was probably thought to be malignancy. However, what they found to their surprise was cryptococcus. And because I have a microbiology background, I've given you some nice pictures there of cryptococcus, uh, which I enjoy looking at. <laughs> so he went to induction therapy with ambosome and 5-FC according to the guidelines. He was given uh, prehydration, but developed an infusion reaction with shivers and shakes. So the infusion was stopped, he was subsequently given at a slower rate and required pre-medication. So this is part of tailoring that therapy before he left hospital. Post this, he then attended daily for outpatient administration. He had regular bloods and one of the advantages to us of giving it in an outpatient setting as opposed to home is the rapidity to which we can get those blood test results and manage renal function or um, electrolyte abnormalities. Um, however, he didn't actually require any further electrolyte replacement, but required adjustment of his 5-FC dosage because of the gradual deterioration in his renal function. And it was that deterioration that um, uh, resulted in an earlier change to oral fluconazole therapy. So um, all of you are very much used to the slides that talk about the differing toxicities related to the different amphotericin products. But I'm aware that Ableset uh, will no longer, with time, be available on the market. And so really what we're talking about now um, is ambosome in terms of administration in this setting. So we know that it's a very broad um, antifungal um, agent. 
and the infusion, according to the Australian Injectables Handbook, which is a, a very good reference, is around 30 to 60 minutes, and that gives you the minimal infusion time which you can use, um, which is important in terms of thinking about time in which this drug is given in the outpatient setting or by your nurse in the community in terms of factoring in time. More rapid infusions than this are not uh, recommended due to um, uh, concentration-dependent intracellular potassium loss and the risk of VF in, in a patient. What we would normally do is that um, we would make, in terms of our uh, HIT service, where the nurse visits the patient's home, this um, antifungal would be made up within the patient's home and obviously in the outpatient setting by the nurse in the outpatient setting. The injectables handbook indicates that you need to use the infusion once it's made up straight away, but if you look at the um, Gilead application to the FDA, it actually gave a window of six hours. So theoretically, we could actually make it up at our Norflax hub and then transfer it out to the patient's home. We don't do that, however. One important thing about administering ambosome is that it's um, incompatible with sodium chloride. So there you have the problem with needing to give prehydration, often with normal saline with a salt loading, and then you require flushing of the lines with 5% glucose prior to infusion. So that incompatibility does not occur. We've never used this drug with someone having a self-connector because they would have to not only connect the um, antifungal, but they would have to flush the line and they'd have to give the prehydration. And we, don't, we haven't really had um, A, enough patients, or B, someone that would have the ability um, to do that. It's an expensive therapy with it being um, $310 per 50 milligrams of um, drug. Um, in terms of reactions of giving the drug, allergic reactions are rare. Um, and reported within the first, first 30 minutes of the first dose. But infusional toxicity um, can occur in up to 20% of patients, usually within the first 20 minutes of the infusion starting. This may manifest in different ways, such as chest pain, shortness of breath, hypoxia, um, flushing and urticaria, and this is actually thought to be due to the liposomal vehicle um, with part of ambosome. So in terms of management, it's uh, this, depending on the severity, it's either stopping or slowing the infusion. And we can actually use pre-medication with antihistamines and Panadol, or if cessation's not a concern, you can use promethazine. Often what we will do is we'll actually extend out our infusion, if this has happened, um, but once we've got pre-medication on board, we normally try them at a shorter infusion time. Because in the, when you're giving this um, in the, you know, not in the hospital setting, time is quite critical in terms of service administration. There's about a 10% rate of nephrotoxicity, nephrotoxicity uh, with this drug. Um, and really this is almost the, the length of therapy um, rate limiting factor. Um, and hyperkalemia and hypermagnesia magnesia all need to be um, uh, checked regularly um, with um, electrolyte tests throughout the week. So it's closer monitoring than often I would do with a beta-lactam agent. And also then the hepatotoxicity, which needs to be monitored for. In terms of the device for giving this drug, um, I need to preface this in that we don't use midlines for any experimenting with midlines, so I haven't commented on those, but we would use a pick line uh, for administration, um, otherwise a very large bore cannula if we had a very short time period in which to give it. And then really what I put there is the pros and cons of the clinic setting and in the home setting, which we've already discussed. And the majority of ours have been given in the outpatient setting. I want to move now to echinocandins, which would probably be the second antifungal agent which may have um, a requirement to give in, in the outpatient setting. We've had two patients recently, one with a candida glabarata peritonitis and one with a candida glabarata picline infection where this was required. Now, um, basically, as you know, there are three types of echinocandins. The dosing of those is slightly different and probably most of the evidence in the studies um, sits behind caspofungin. In our hospital, we use an indula fungin, and this is purely a cost-based decision. Um, and all the echinocandins have poor bioavailability, so there's not this availability of an oral switch as there is with the azoles. It is highly protein-bound, and so um, it's important that in the prescribing of this agent that there's the knowledge that there's limited delivery to the brain and the eyeball, which are often places candida can go, so it cannot be used to treat these infections. Um, it has very few drug interactions, so it's quite clean from that point, away, point of view. and also has really limited toxicity because of its specific binding. 
So as a drug, it's relatively um, easy to give. It's also cheaper than ambazone. So in terms of administration, again, um, what we would do is we'd reconstitute the vial and make an infusion solution, and this has to be pretty much used within 24 hours. So that time of utilisation really impacts how we deliver this drug. It's not something that we can pre-order and have sitting at our, at our peripheral site to administer to patients. It's really an infusion that has to be made up by the nurses before they give it um, to the patient either at home or in the outpatient setting. Um, again, uh, we would use a pick or a peripheral drip with a large vein for short periods. And I've seen in the US data they are actually infusers um, which you can, um, would have to make up uh, prior to going to the patient's home. Um, importantly, all echinocannons do have the potential for inducing a hypersensitivity reaction when you're administering the drug. And um, really this relates to a higher infusion rate. So the value given is when the rate exceeds 1.1 milligrams per mil. Um, and it's more common with the nidula fungin we've found than other echinocandins. This is related to a histamine release. And this results in rash, urticaria, flushing, pyrexia and hypotension. And it can normally be managed by slowing the infusion rate and also antihistamines. But you can imagine if this drug hadn't been given prior to leaving hospital and you were the nurse managing the patient at home, this would be quite startling. Um, local infusion site irritation can be problematic, and so that's why we only use our peripheral cannulas for short periods of therapy, um, and there's a risk of um, thrombophlebitis. And really the GI side effects and LFT and um, uh, haematological side effects mentioned are far more common with Casper fungin and Mica fungin than with indigenous fungin. Uh, the article that I referenced down there, when it talks about side effects of Casper fungin and Mica fungin, if you go back and look at it, these are listed at about 10%, where similar side effects with indigenous fungin are sort of less than 1%, so probably an easier drug to give. I just wanted to quickly touch on um, therapeutic drug monitoring and I, with the recognition that um, this is not able to be offered in, in all centres. But in saying that, the lab at times will go and very carefully uh, use uh, methodology such as a sensitita to give you an MIC for your fungal isolate. But it's important to note probably in antifungals there is actually probably very limited role for therapeutic drug monitoring. And really this relates to the fact there is insufficient data to link therapeutic outcomes to use routinely. So they're a guide but really not much more than that. Now this is a slide to signal that we're swapping to antivirals. And um, what this is is an endothelial cell with an inclusion body due to CMV which looks like an owl's eye. So you won't forget that after today's talk. So I wanted to take this back to a case, and in terms of antiviral therapy, this case was about a 65-year-old female who had end-stage renal failure secondary to adult polycystic kidney disease. She had dialysis, um, and then went to peritoneal dialysis, and then finally got a donor transplant. And those of you that have done renal medicine will know how significant that is in terms of quality of life. She had a donor who was CMV positive to a recipient herself, which was she was CMV negative, she had a few um, course complications, including um, delayed graft function and gastrointestinal toxicity, and she was on immunosuppressive therapy. Unfortunately, with monitoring after the transplant, her CMV viral load continued to increase. She was clinically well and her graft function was stable, and she was managed by starting a Valgan cyclovir by the renal team. Unfortunately, her viral load continued to rise, and they admitted her to hospital for IV gancyclovir. After three days of therapy on the ward, we were asked to take her on our HIF and IPAT service and see whether this was possible. So in talking about gancyclovir, we know it's active against most herpes viruses. It's a static antiviral agent, and it's eliminated by renal excretion. There's no hepatic metabolism, but really it hasn't been studied in people with significant hepatic dysfunction. And generally, we give doses around five milligrams per kilogram twice a day, and there's sort of a one hour infusion time. In terms of that oral drug switch, which we've mentioned a couple of times today, um, Valgan cyclovir um, in a 900 milligram oral dose does actually equate to about five milligrams per kilogram dose of um, gancyclovir. So often all the recommendations suggest changing to Valgan cyclovir if you can, but she'd obviously failed this, and which is why we're using the IV therapy. Now, Valgan cyclovir, this was going to be problematic 
for us for a number of reasons. Firstly, actually doing strict BD visits is, is very difficult for our service, the way the workflow um, is. Um, and uh, the second thing is it's considered a hazardous medication. So the nurses now need to bring um, uh, cytotoxic precautions into the patient's home. So in terms of um, the drug, it comes in a vial which needs to be reconstituted and then further diluted. But however, the nurses cannot do this because it's a cytotoxic drug. You are able to order the drug manufactured from the drug company and because of its stability for 15 days, this gave us enough lag time with ordering and getting the drug to the patient. But however, how you administer it is quite important too because of its toxicity, it requires um, a central line. The other thing is that it has a number of side effects which require quite frequent monitoring. So this really brings up the resource side of using antifungals and antivirals and that we were required to do really quite daily check-ins with this patient looking for side effects. We had to give nurses a you know, checklist what they needed to look for in toxicity with a drug they weren't familiar with. And um, we also had to do very frequent uh, monitoring. So in terms of how she progressed, she tolerated the drug well on the ward and we managed to um, organise BD home visits via a pump. Uh, they used cytotoxic precautions, her renal function remained stable, um, and it complicated by neutropenia for which we started GCSF. However, her viral load continued to rise despite the gancyclovir, and resistance testing came back showing that she was resistant. So we stopped this and she was readmitted again to start Foscarnet. And I'm sure you can imagine what the next question to us was. So we then had to go and research Foscarnet. And um, with Foscarnet, normally it's given in two or three divided doses um, and we use an induction phase of therapy, which is around three weeks before we can uh, reduce the amount we have to give. The dose has to be adjusted according to uh, renal function, um, but no dose adjustment with hepatic insufficiency and cytotoxic precautions um, are required. It already comes in a pre-made formulation of six grams per 250 mils, and so therefore what the nurses could do was just draw up the amount they actually required, but it does require a central line due to toxicity. Again, we had to be very careful about, and this, this um, you know, ideally you'd have experience with administration of this drug, but what we had was experienced nurses with antibiotic, um, with uh, administration that were using their ability here. And so rapid injection is not recommended due to seizures and electrolyte abnormalities. And so the infusion could be out to two hours and obviously for the bigger doses we'd give a two hour infusion. And there's also the prehydration. So already from a workflow perspective, to give this in the patient's home, the nurse was required to be there for the prehydration IV phase and then the administration phase. So it was actually very labour intensive to administer. Um, it can also, uh, we talked about cause chlorophobitis and the significant PK variation between patients. There's no oral alternative and it costs around $200 a day. So armed with that knowledge, uh, she went on to the service with four grams of Foscarnet BD over 60 minutes. Um, we required, um, and obviously prehydration, we required second daily monitoring with bloods. And one of the things about in the community is that if nurses going to their home and taking bloods, there is often some time before that blood gets back to the service that can provide the pathology results. And so already we had slight delay in managing the electrolytes that we required. In terms of um, how she progressed, um, on the right hand side there I have side effects which are listed about 1% of Foscarnet and those include neurotoxicity, um, uh, cough, shortness of breath, fatigue, abdominal pain, genital ulceration um, and then we've already talked about the electro electrolyte disturbances and the nephrotoxicity. To me, um, seeing her on the program really showed me the toxicity of Foscarnet in that she developed morning headaches which were quite disabling. But in no way did she want to stop the therapy because she didn't want to lose her kidney. Um, and she also had a fall at home and I noticed her becoming increasingly fatigued to the point that we offered uh, further hospital admission but she was adamant she did not want to come in. Due to the her magnesium dropped but we managed to maintain it with oral supplementation and due to burning chest pain during infusion we had to slow our infusion rates. So again this, in, this rate of uh, this visit time was extended quite significantly and was really becoming a problem for administration for the service. Um, thankfully around that time uh, there were early papers around using lametivir um, in this setting and so we changed her to this oral drug um, for another further month 
Her immunosuppression was changed, her viral load came under control, and she's now currently well with her transplant. Uh, so this is one of my last slides. I just wanted to mention um, acyclovir. So this is probably the main antiviral drug we give in our service for um, either encephalitis or mainly encephalitis. And this has either been given us by HIF, where they do connect to Baxter Infuser, or it is given by someone who's given it with self-connectors previously. Um, basically, the data I'm showing you up here is related to the elastomeric infusers, which are often an easier way to give the drug. And you can have concentrations of 5 to 10 milligrams per mil. And as long as you're careful with your temperature control, um, you know, it has quite a long shelf life and we use it as a 24-hour um, administration. We administer it through a central line because extravasation can cause tissue necrosis and um, normally we get our patients uh, to have some form of prehydration um, before we give the drug. Side effects are uncommon um, uh, and rarely can get nephrotoxicity or neurotoxicity. I just wanted to highlight these two tables which are available to you. This one comes from the 2018 IDSA guidelines and this is, relates to their antifungals. You won't be able to read that. Uh, antifungals and antivirals, but has nice guidelines regarding monitoring, monitoring and infusion times and side effects. And then there's second tables by a Spanish paper, and they had um, some nice data on stability. However, this doesn't always correspond with the Australian uh, Injectables Handbook. Um, what I've put there are some useful references. If you go back uh, to the talk and you are um, faced with a situation of having to give an antifungal or an antiviral agent. And in summary, I think that utilisation of these drugs, um, because of the patient cohort, is, is limited. There's limited requirement for this, but it does require suitable patient selection. There has to be careful patient review for interactions, very close patient monitoring, um, adequate resources because of the time they take and ideally um, experience with the agents being utilised. Thank you.